first and foremost, what is the problem? What is, what is the pain point that you're solving? Second, why are you best suited to solve that pain? And three, which comes out of that, is team. Maybe we could start with uh, just a little bit more about our backgrounds and maybe tell them about Class Capital. Sure. So um, I started the firm about six years ago. Um, prior to that, I was making uh, much larger investments, but fell in love with the enterprise software model. I have been investing in software now for about 10 years, and we have a portfolio of 16 software companies. Overall, we do combined a couple hundred million of revenue across our companies. We've also moved a bit later stage and now acquire companies and fix them up. We have a talent team on staff, so what we do is we go into a company and we will get involved in help, helping building out the team, and, uh, which is a lot of fun. So we have two people on our team, and in the talent team we place 150 people in our portfolio companies in the past um, 18 months. And we're building out that expertise in the, in the PR side. We have an analyst and associate. We also work with our companies to help make acquisitions. And our average growth in our portfolio is about 56% this year. And we are driving almost everyone to a break-even level. So we're pretty capital efficient in the way we look at our businesses. A little bit about uh, Omer's Ventures. Uh, we are, obviously, we're part of uh, the Ontario Municipal Employees Pension Plan. We manage uh, roughly $100 billion in assets. Uh, across every major uh, category, you know, infrastructure, private equity, real estate. Uh, we've got a big capital markets group. And uh, almost five years ago now, uh, we created a small little venture fund. Um, small in terms of Omer's world, but not small uh, in Canada. We started with a $200 million fund that was focused on technology investments in Canada. Um, and there was a small team of us that were assembled at that time. We were five people, I believe. And we were told, you know, uh, go find the best companies in this country uh, in technology, and, and we tried to do that. Uh, fast forward to today, uh, we have uh, close to 470 million under management across two main funds. Um, our team has grown to over 15 professionals today, um, and we've recently started to look outside of Canada very selectively. So, if I were to summarize what Omer's Ventures does today, we are a true VC fund in every sense of the word. Uh, we look to make technology investments that range in size from half a million to 40 million, and we've hit both of those bars. Um, we, our sweet spot tends to be Series A, but we do go earlier and we do go later. Um, and we, we look to take non-controlling interests in technology companies and work really, really hard for those companies uh, to try and help them grow and build um, sustainable, um, impactful businesses. So if, if you were to try and define um, what is it you look for in investments when, when companies come and pitch to you, um, how, would you how, how would you describe that to, to the folks here today? Sure, and I'll, I'll give you some, maybe I'll lead with that, talk a bit about the lessons I've learned and then how we came up with these decisions because you know, when, when I started in the business, um, there were things like a Groupon-type deal was coming to us every day. And, you know, one of the things we see, and, and I'm sure Damien sees this too, is the deals come in waves. And as soon as deals start to come in waves and you see the same kind of deals coming in that pattern, like you see all of a sudden a whole bunch of Groupons starting, it's almost like a sign that you shouldn't be investing in those type of companies. And the barriers to entry aren't very high. But one of the biggest lessons I've learned so far and what I look for is I used to back, um, and this is not going to, uh, this is not going to sound good, but I don't look for the entrepreneur as, I'm, as I do as much the business today. So the business to me is way more important than the entrepreneur. And the reason I say that is some entrepreneurs just go down the wrong rabbit hole. Some entrepreneurs go into an e-commerce space that's highly competitive than at Amazon's going to win. And so I used to, when I first started in the business, when I invested in Freshy, which was, I invested in Matthew Corn, I really believed in him. But today when I look at a business, I look at the business attributes first and then I think about the entrepreneur. So that's the first thing. I mean, that, that, is, that is crucial to me. The second thing is I look for consistency. So if someone's coming to me and sitting down with me and, and now we're moving on to the entrepreneur, there's some signals that, or signs that come to me that immediately turn me off an opportunity. One of them is if I meet an entrepreneur and he's constantly talking about the exit and what this company could one day sell for and, and that kind of opportunity. And I look at that. I'm looking for people that have a great business that want to build a great business over time and have, take a much longer term approach. So I, I get turned off pretty quickly if I see someone looking for a quick exit. That's not appealing to me. The other thing is, 
and we're both trained like this, is I look for consistency. So when someone's telling me a story, I ask the same questions in seven, eight different ways. And I look for that consistent pattern, and I look for a partner that I could really enjoy working with. We've both been pretty successful now. We don't have to put money to work. You know, we could actually, that's when we start making mistakes. And so um, we're looking for people that we can enjoy working with because we are going to be, I mean, OMAS and, and Class both invest for a long time. We have investments that have been sitting around for me. I have investments that are now 11 years old. And um, being partners with someone for 11 years, I just, life's too short. So I really have to enjoy working with that person. Yeah, that last point's uh, a good one. I'm extremely fortunate and happy that I'm finally at a point in my career where I choose not to work with assholes. Right? And, and you know, it, it sounds funny, but uh, what you need to remember as entrepreneurs, when you're, looking for, when you're looking for the right venture fund and the right investor, if you're, a, if you're any type of startup or any type of early stage startup, this is a long relationship that you're entering into with these investors. And so, you know, w when, when I'm sitting on one side of the table, I'm literally the first meeting looking across at him or she and saying, you know, do I want to work with this person for the next possibly 10 years? And, you know, um, whereas maybe earlier in my career, I would have looked away from certain attributes and said, you know, I just need to make money and, and that's the most important thing. Frankly, um, it's, that's not the case anymore. And what I've learned is ultimately it comes down to making money, but I've found and I've experienced that if you invest in the people that have the same values as you, people with integrity, uh, people that you can actually work with and that will allow you to help them, um, which is a big thing for, for some CEOs. Those are the companies that actually succeed more in the long run. And so indirectly, we are being selfish and worrying about returns, but it really is important. And, and you, know, you mentioned something, that the people, um, that's actually number one on my list. It's you know, who is, who's the team, who's the backer of the company, Who's the team that, that's going to take this idea or this early stage business and, and grow it to that next level? Um, you know, markets change. Companies hopefully change along with those markets. If you don't have the right team in place, you're going to fail right away. Um, and so the danger I find with, with just tunnel vision looking at just the business is, um, you know, if I think back in the 10 years that I've been in venture, um, and, the, and I look at the companies that I've been lucky enough to, to exit and sell, very few of those companies in the tech world are actually still doing exactly what they said they were going to do when we invested. And if you look at those companies, the, the consistent theme across the board and the ones that have been successful is team. It is, it is it absolutely 100% is team and it's are the right people in place to be able to weave and bob and adjust along with the market and not stay tunnel vision and, and just you know, keep doing the same thing over and over again without results. If I look back at the most successful entrepreneurs I've worked with, they all have one skill first and foremost. They're able to manage their business at an extremely, extremely low burn rate until they know they have something. Right. You know, it's, there's no point spending millions of dollars on sales and marketing if you don't have product market fit. And um, I actually just, I just wrote a blog about the similarities between poker and running a business. And, and I'm a poker player as well, and I think everybody should do both. He's taking a lot of my money. <laughs> there's a lot of similarities, and one of them is bluffing. And I said, you know, when you're starting a business, it's okay to bluff, right? I tell, I tell my founders all the time, fake it. Fake it until you know that somebody's going to pay for it, and then build it, because it's much cheaper. The worst thing you can do is spend two years building something and then realize that nobody wants to pay for hey, it. Hey, we were both investors in Verisent. Remember how he, <laughs> you want to tell that story? Absolutely. That, well, <laughs> I mean, it's this to an extreme, right? Um, so, so uh, you know, think of, think of ways that you can test the market, ways that you can test your customers. You can build the coolest product in the world. If it doesn't solve a pain and nobody's willing to pay for it, that's not a business. Right? And you can get them, you can be creative in terms of how you fund it. I mean, a lot of our companies get their customers to fund a lot of their development, right? And, and that shows that they clearly have the pain, and, and they do. They, they work with us together. In fact, 
some of them are try are, need to solve the problem so badly that they will work with us and pay for funding the product, and they don't, they don't even care if their competitors get to use it. So I think the, the faking might sound like a strong word, but being really creative to find ways to help get your customers to help fund your projects is a really neat way of building a business. You know, let's flip it around a little bit. If I'm an entrepreneur pitching a business to you, what are the sure ways for me not to get your money? So, so again, I, we, really focus on, we really focus on the business more than the entrepreneur, which is a little bit of a uh, counterintuitive approach or not what other venture funds say. Um, and so we see, we don't invest in a company, you know, you come and meet with us and, and we invest in a business immediately. And another one of your partners had the, line, the comment about you invest in uh, lines, not dots, and remember that comment, but it's, it's kind of true. You come and you build a relationship over time uh, and you, you show that you'd be a good partner and you can't walk into our office and expect us to write a check. And, and really, uh, 20 or 30% of the capital that we invest is my own capital. So you can't just walk in. It's not like we're, we're looking at it as an asset manager. We're looking at it as we're a business owner with you. And so, again, the key thing, the, the thing that really turns me off when someone comes in is tell me who else is interested in it. I don't care who else is interested in your business. You know, conventional wisdom yields conventional returns. And so don't tell me who else is investing in your deal. I'm not interested. Um, and, and don't tell me about the exits. Come to me and talk about how you have a plan to build a great business and why you're solving a problem. Yeah, that last one drives me crazy. You know, you flip through a, pay, you flip through a deck, and then all of a sudden the last slide says, you know, we're going to sell this business for X to X. And I'm like, well, great. Why do you need my money, right? You've know, got it all figured out. Just go do it. But, um, you know, a few things that kind of irk me more than anything, and it's, it's tips that I give entrepreneurs. And this first one, I don't know if there's uh, investment bankers in the room, but we can say it because we used to be investment bankers. Don't show up to a pitch with your investment banker. You know, have advisors, have lots of them. If they're free, they're even better. Um, but when you go to pitch with an investor, think about some of the stuff we said earlier. We're trying to get to, uh, we're trying to, get to know you, right? So what happens typically is when you bring an advisor to that pitch, they can't help themselves. They answer questions. And so I'll ask a question, they'll answer, and then I'll say, great. And I'll ask a question again. Um, other little things. And this is maybe, uh, I don't know if everybody agrees with this, but because I see it a lot. Don't put pre-written valuation terms in your deck, right? Don't come to me and tell me your business is worth $10 million and you're raising a million. Because what have you done, right? If I don't think your business is worth $10 million, am I going to pay $10 million? No. If I think your business is worth more than $10 million, am I going to pay more than $10 million after you just told me it was worth ten? million? No. So all you've done is set a ceiling on your valuation, right? Valuation is such, I mean, we could, we could talk for hours about valuation, but and this sounds very um, self-serving, <laughs> and I realize that. But valuation, when you're out meeting investors, should be one of the last things on your list, right? You're about to embark on a 10-year relationship with an investor who hopefully is going to take your business and 100 exit. Do you really think the difference of a $9 million pre-money or a $10 million pre-money is going to make a lick of a difference by the time you sell the business? Absolutely not. But if you take the money from the wrong investor, I promise you that will have a huge impact as, as you grow the business. And the wrong investor, frankly, won't allow you to grow your business the way that it could. Um, right. So I, find, I just find people get so fixated on, on valuation. And, and the reality is we're, you know, we're finance guys by background. I promise you, if you're so fixated on $10 million in my example, I can structure a deal that makes you think you're getting a $10 million valuation, but at the end of the day, I'm paid as if we valued it at seven, right? And unless you have one of those good advisors, you probably wouldn't even know. So the point is, keep it clean, find the right investor, don't get fixated on valuation, and I think in the long run, you're much better off. That's a good point, and I also think, um, don't come out and meet with the investor and say, I'm not raising money. You're obviously there to raise money. I mean, right. I'm not raising money, but I I'm coming to be money, with you. Yeah, I, don't I need want you money. to talk to me for an hour. And, uh, and don't go through, I mean, I, the, one of the questions I saw there was, should you have a pitch deck? You should have a book and maybe talk about your market size and stuff, but don't go through your book. Build the relationship with whoever you're meeting with. When you go through and go through a presentation, no one wants to listen to the presentation. You want to have an engaging conversation, build a relationship, understand the business. 
But if you're sitting there and you have to get through that book from A to B and you can't answer any questions so you've gone through the book, you know you're not a creative thinker. And how many great entrepreneurs aren't creative thinkers? I would say have a book, though. And I know you yeah. said that because here's how, it, here's how a pitch goes when you don't have a book. is It's like a first date, right? You, you, everything's going well, and then there's inevitably that awkward silence, right? And here's, here's the reality. We love awkward silences, right? We're very comfortable in silence in a pitch because we do it all the time. And we know that following that awkward silence always comes something that later you wish you wouldn't have told us. Right? And there's like the real truth. So it, the best pitches in the world don't use decks, but having it there, A, it gives you a tremendous amount of confidence, and B, when you hit that awkward silence, you can go, ah, let's flip to the competitive landscape on slide eight <laughs> and go like this. Right? So I won't read a business plan, first of all. Um, I don't have time. Um, so I'll answer the question, uh, when I read a pitch deck, uh, what do I look for? Um, and I'm serious by that. You know, uh, if you're going to an institutional VC, don't waste your time writing an 80-page business plan. When, you th when you're at home thinking of whether or not you build your business, write a business plan because it forces you to think through all the things you need to think through. By the time you've started your business, I don't want to see that business plan. I want to see, see a pitch deck. And if I can oversimplify it, the things I look for is, first and foremost, what is the problem? What is, what is the pain point that you're solving? Second, why are you best suited to solve that pain? And three, which comes out of that, is team. Um, you need to show that you have a knowledge of the competitive landscape. No competition is never, ever an answer. Um, and as I said, don't put, don't put a valuation or an exit number in the deck. Uh, what do, you, what, do you read business plans? Yeah, you know. <laughs> I th I'm not sure they meant business plan, they meant pitch deck or whatever they meant, but I, I do read, I do read the, uh, I mean, we have a team of people that go through it and bring um, the more interesting opportunities up to review. But I think the key thing is, I don't, we don't, because we're a little later, we don't value opportunities. And I also don't care if it's a big market or small market. Um, I, I look at a couple of things when I look at the value. One is I make sure it's not a tool versus a big enterprise solution. When a company comes to us with an enterprise solution, to me it's a much more valuable business versus a small applicational tool, right? And then the next thing I look at is, I don't even mind um, what your current revenues are. I really look at the incremental revenues that you're able to get on a monthly basis, because that to me tells a story in terms of how quickly you're growing. And the most important thing in terms of valuation, if you were to value something, is, is the growth. Um, and that incremental, we, now I'm, I'm focused on enterprise software, but it's become a bit of a science. You could look at how much capital are you spending and, and how quickly the company's growing. So we saw a company in Milan that we landed up investing in, um, and a company called Deutsche Bell, and they were adding thirty or $40,000 of incremental MRR a month. It was only $2 million revenue company, but if you do the math, thirty or 40000 a month, they're adding $3, $4 million of revenue on an annual basis, right? And they were doing it without ever meeting the customer in person. So I thought, wow, look how capital efficient this company is. They're actually, they're based in Milan. They're winning North American clients. They're never meeting their customer. They're adding thirty, forty thousand dollars a month in incremental MRR. To me, that is the most valuable business. You know, we couldn't move fast enough to make that investment in the company. And um, but we're very valuation sensitive. In my mind, when we look at, we, you can only do three things when you buy into a business. You can control what you pay for it. You control what you do in the middle, and you control the exit. And so, valuation is such an important part. And people that are not paying attention to valuation today are not going to be in business 10, 20 years from now in, this, in the business we're in.